Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me, uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. Uh, my work with the uh, Gates Public Library. I certainly want to thank them for facilitating this meeting. I want to thank Paula Blackburn for uh, really just putting this together and, um, you know, bringing everyone together. Uh, having said that, uh, let's get into it. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Dr. Cedric Batchetou. I'm a graduate of Albany College of Pharmacy, class of 2013, where I obtained my doctorate of pharmacy. To date, I have been doing these seminars for about seven years. And so uh, in addition to these seminars, I have a uh, podcast which takes place twice a month. It's called uh, Self-Care Forum, and we bring in different health professionals to talk about different things, including gut health. So it's a uh, really good podcast. It's available on all major uh, platforms, so check it out. Today, we're going to be talking about gut health and the role of the gut and its significance in our health. Uh, it's actually more intricately connected than many of us uh, usually uh, think about. But there's a very famous quote by Hippocrates. For those who may not know him, he's considered, widely considered the father of, of medicine or the father of modern medicine. Uh, but one quote that's attributed to him is all disease begins in the gut. Now, he said this more than 2000 years ago, but we're really only starting to understand the significance of that quote. Uh, you know, there are two variables that actually determine our gut health. The first one, which we'll look into is the microbiota or the gut flora. These are the uh, living organisms that make up our gut, that align our gut. And the second is the gut barrier. You can think about it like a wall, which determines what goes in and out and enters your blood. But I want to give you an illustration of what this whole this all looks like, starting with your mouth. Actually, your mouth is where your gut begins, okay? The mouth is where the gut begins. So you can think of it as when you take a bite out of an apple, you know, the mouth chews it, swallows it, goes down your esophagus into your stomach. And right as it's in your stomach, it's exposed to chemical digestion where, or chemical and mechanical digestion where the food is broken down into its minute nutrients, which are then passed along your small and then large intestine. And so the gut is really the means by which our tissue and organs and our cells receive nutrients in order to function. And it consists of the whole gamut from the process of breaking down foods to the extraction of nutrients, to the fact, to the act of converting it to energy, and even the removal of waste that all takes place in your gut. Now, interesting thing to keep in mind, when something is in your gut, it's considered out of your body. I know that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for some because it's in your body, but really the gut is a separate space from your body. See, your body is your blood. The gut is a hollow tube that goes through your body. So when something is in your gut or inside of your gut, it's technically outside of your body, even though it's inside of your body. Try to wrap that around, try to have, wrap your head around that. But this is what we're talking about when we mention gut flora. And this plays a really crucial role in our health. So our gut is home to over a hundred million, a hundred trillion microorganisms. Over a thousand species of different microbes live there, make their home in the gut. Now, for most of those microbes, it's a mutual relationship. And what that simply means is we benefit from them being there and they benefit from the foods that we, can that we eat, that we consume. So it's almost like sometimes you eat certain things and these, these germs, these microbes, they get free food because you're the one providing it to them. But they also help facilitate the process of digesting that food and the absorption of nutrients from that food. So it's a mutualistic relationship that we have with our gut microbes. Now, of course, not all microbes are beneficial to us. Some are very harmful. And so it's about finding the right balance, right? With the, uh, it's, about cons uh, it's about trying to maintain a very uh, large quantity of the beneficial uh, microbes and shunning or, or reducing 
uh, the amount of the harmful microbes. Now, the human gut, interestingly enough, has about 10 times more bacteria than all the cells in the body. So that's about 30 trillion. Now, let's talk about the benefits of these germs, these microbes, these gut flora. And again, try to wrap your head around this. You know, from ever since we're children, we're told that germs are bad, but that's not necessarily true. These germs are actually very, uh, are actually a normal part of your gastrointestinal function. Not only that, they also serve to protect you from infection, right? Because remember, when something is in your gut, it's technically outside of your body. In order for it to enter your body or your bloodstream, it has to go through your gut. Your gut has to allow it in. And so when your, your gut microbes, many a times when they come in contact with harmful bacteria or viruses, they won't let them in. They will not let them enter your bloodstream. And so that's one way or one mechanism in which they can protect you from infection. But they also play a crucial role in regulating our metabolism, okay? Because remember, how fast you're able to digest or break down a certain food may depend on the uh, quantity and quality of gut microbes that you have. So they play a crucial role in your metabolism. Some people feel sluggish, and that may be due to the fact that their gut microbes are not necessarily the ones that are going to help with digestion. And so your gut microbe changes with regards to how you live and some of the things that you that you eat. So the gut is crucial for your immune system. As a matter of fact, it is the largest organ in your immune system. Now remember, please keep in mind, the gut begins in your mouth and it ends in your anus, right? That long hollow tube that goes through your body and loops around, that is what we are referring to. Now, of course, when we look at the gut in the context of the modern lifestyle, the modern lifestyle is actually very disruptive to the gut, uh, to the gut health uh, that we try to maintain. Let me tell you why. First of all, we have this wonderful drug, these wonderful classes of drugs called antibiotics. Now, of course, they have their place. Antibiotics are very helpful uh, in terms of get, helping our bodies get rid of bacteria, harmful bacteria. Uh, but here's the thing we have to understand, ladies and gentlemen. When you take a course of antibiotics, you've also got to be mindful that the antibiotics don't just kill the bad bacteria. They also kill the good bacteria. But now we're beginning to see more and more doctors and recommend the idea that when someone goes through a course of antibiotics, immediately after you're done, they will recommend, uh, they will give you a prescription for probiotics because they understand that probiotics are crucial. Now it is widely understood that probiotics are crucial for someone's health and well being. And so, uh, but we have to understand that antibiotics have their place, but they, they don't discriminate between the good and bad microbes. They kill them all. Now, you also have other drugs such as NSAIDs. You're looking at things like Motrin, ibuprofen, a lot of these over-the-counter pain relievers, uh, and even the way in which a child is born, for example. Uh, you know, a study out in uh, the UK showed that children that were born uh, by C-section uh, when compared to children that were born by uh, natural uh, vaginal birth, uh, had a diff were exposed to different microbes. Uh, the ones who were born by C-section were found to have some of the bacteria that were floating around in the hospital from whence they were born. And, and these bacteria were not necessarily beneficial. They were harmful bacteria. And uh, the ones that were born through natural vaginal route, uh, many of them were exposed to uh, the healthy bacteria that line the white, the woman's uh, vagina. So as the child is coming out, the child is getting those beneficial uh, microbes. So, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing with the modern lifestyle are disruptive. And so it starts as early as when we're born and how we're born. Now, of course, it's not just the lifestyle, it's also the diet. Uh, you've got, uh, we have an obsession with refined carbs, cookies, cakes, and ice cream. <laughs> You know, we're obsessed. Everything we consume nowadays has sugar, yeah, except water, okay, except water. But even juices, you know, juices are packed full of sugar. And, and so all of these things feed the harmful bacteria. They don't feed the good and beneficial bacteria. They feed the harmful bacteria. Now, we also have a diet that's generally, many in the West, not everybody, but many generally have a diet that's low in fibers and 
high in toxins. We're talking about wheat-based products. We're talking about industrial seed oils, you know, canola oil, uh, grape seed oil. A lot of these oils are not necessarily uh, benign. Many of them are harmless. They're cheap, but they're also harmless. <laughs> so, but it's not just what we eat and our diet. It's also the, the uh, social environments in which we find ourselves. For example, chronic stress uh, affects your gut health as well as chronic infections. So all of these factors, which are components of modern life today in America and the West and the developed world are constantly disrupting our gut. So it's important that we pay special attention to our gut because it is a determinant of our health. Now, this is what we mean when we say the gut barrier. Okay, we talked about how you have microbes uh, or the uh, flora that essentially helps your immune system, but it also helps break down foods and helps with your metabolism. But there's also a gut barrier that, uh, that determines what goes in and out of your gut. Okay, now you can think about this as, uh, think of it like a wall. Now, remember this, ladies and gentlemen, the gut is a hollow tube that passes from your mouth to the anus. When something is inside of your gut, it is outside of your body, even though you swallowed it, okay? You've got to understand that concept. Inside of your gut is still outside of the body. The tube itself is a whole, it, you know, from the mouth to your anus, it's one whole tube, it twists, it loops, it turns, but it's one hollow tube. And so when you understand that, you understand that when something is in the gut, it's not in the body. It will try to get in the body, and that's through the uh, mucosal membrane cells, okay? That's the gut barrier that determines what gets in uh, of the body or in the blood or what stays out. And so the contents of the gut are considered outside of the body. Now, there's this theory uh, known as the leaky gut theory. And what the theory simply says is that the intestinal barrier determines whether we're going to tolerate something that we've eaten or we're going to react negatively to something we've eaten. Uh, perhaps you've heard of things like gluten allergies or, or food insensitivities or food intolerance or an allergic reaction or inflammation. Okay, all of these generally are symptoms of a leaky gut. And so what that means, I want to show you by pointing you to the illustration right in front of you. What that means, ladies and gentlemen, is when you and I, uh, depending on the state of our gut, okay, if we have a healthy gut and we're eating healthy foods and we're reducing our stresses and we're not eating too much sugar and we're dealing, taking care of ourselves, we're going to experience what you see here on the left-hand side of the illustration. That's called a tight junction. A tight junction simply means that your cells are tight together. They're not weakened, they're strong, they're not simply going to allow harmful substances to come in. And so they're able to keep toxins and viruses and microorganisms and uh, gluten, which is nothing but an undigested molecule. It's gonna keep these things inside of your gut and outside of your blood. Okay, now in a situation where you have leaky gut or you have inflamed gut, so essentially those same cells that would otherwise form a tight junction, form a strong wall, they would weaken and they would there would become spaces uh, uh, in between them. And so this allows for these harmful substances to sneak through, right? It's leaky. You know, imagine poking a hole uh, inside a water bottle. It starts to leak. Things go where they're not supposed to go. And so leaky gut simply uh, accounts for a lot of these harmful things getting inside of our blood. Now, what happens when these things enter our bloodstream? You got to remember, ladies and gentlemen, the life of the body is in the blood. And what that simply means is when something enters your blood, that's when it does its damage. Okay. And so this can be, uh, this can lead to nutrient malabsorption, autoimmune reaction, food intolerances, blood brain barrier breach, and systemic inflammation. Now, Leaky gut can manifest as these things, but it can also manifest as skin problems. Things such as eczema and psoriasis, can, depending on where it takes place, can manifest as heart failure. Some of the harmful things that enter your blood can travel up to your heart, can manifest as autoimmune diseases, such as celiac disease, Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, okay, uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, can even affect your mental health, such as autism and even depression, okay? So, 
the gut plays a role in virtually every aspect of your health. It may not be a cause, but it can certainly be a contributor to these things. Okay, so let's talk about what a healthy digestion looks like, because this is actually very, very interesting. So this is an illustration of your stomach. And within the stomach, you're going to have different types of bacteria. Uh, what you're seeing here is H. pylori, which is uh, believed to be responsible for ulcers. A lot of these ulcers and digestive issues that uh, people experience, uh, you know, uh, but within your stomach, you also have these cells known as parietal cells. These cells are responsible for the production and the secretion of stomach acid. Now, a healthy gut has a low pH, okay? Low pH is what you want. Low pH simply means it's very acidic. I want to give you an illustration. A low pH can be thought of as a volcano's lava, okay? If you stick your hand for just one second inside of lava, right out of a volcano. The moment you pull it out, you're not gonna have anything there. Your hand would have likely melted, okay? So low, you can think of low pH as being really strong or really, really capable of breaking down or melting things. So pH is simply a measure of the acidity. So a healthy stomach needs to have a very low pH, meaning it can break down things quickly and fairly rapidly. So it means you have a strong acid. Now, the breakdown and absorption of nutrients, the digestion of protein, carbs, and fats is crucial for your health because you've got to absorb these nutrients and then transfer these nutrients to all of your cells, your organs, and other parts of your body in order to function properly. Now, here's what tends to happen. In a situation where you have good stomach acid or low pH, anything that you consume will be quickly broken down and will be passed into your small intestine to be absorbed for the nutrients, for the micronutrients to be absorbed. However, for many people, generally, the older we get, uh, the weaker our pH becomes, which means it's, it's not as strong in terms of melting or breaking down or dissolving things. And so food will begin to last longer in your stomach when you're older, when compared to when you were younger. And so the problem with that is you've got a bunch of bacteria in your stomach, whose job it is to eat and ferment that food. And so when they ferment the food that's in your stomach, that's not being broken down fast enough, uh, they produce a byproduct called gas. And so that gas maybe uh, a lot of times is responsible for the uh, acid reflux that you feel, you know, that, that feeling of acid climbing up to your esophagus uh, and burning your throat, uh, that is a lot of the times caused by the, these bacteria uh, that are breaking down undigested carbs, mainly carbs, because these germs love sugar. They love anything sweet. They love anything that is going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, give them energy and the ability to reproduce, okay? Now, uh, stomach acid is generally released in conjunction with a, a, a hormone called pepsin, an enzyme called pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that's responsible for breaking down protein. So you can think of things uh, such as meat. Now, causes for low stomach acid. Again, what you want, you don't want low stomach acid. You want high stomach acid. Low pH means your stomach acid is high or strong or very, uh, you know, it, it's doing its job. Now, several causes is an H. pylori infection. And so these germs represented by the green little alien-like monster, uh, squid-like tentacles uh, that you see here in the illustration, they're H. pylori. The more of them there are in your stomach, okay, they begin to affect uh, acid production. They actually begin to reduce acid production. And that's harmful because you want plenty of acid production. You want your acid to be strong enough to break down the foods. Now, of course, you also have chronic stress. Earlier, we mentioned that stress affects your gut health, but it, it also, and, and your stomach is part of your gut. Okay. So if you're constantly stressed, and I think anybody who's, you know, been in a very stressful situation will, will notice that, you know, uh, one of the things that changes is their diet or, or their, you know, they, maybe they don't go to the bathroom as much or, you know, but stress affects your body's ability to digest things. Of course, you also have acid suppressing drugs. 
um, you know, such as Prilosect, uh, Pepsid, you know, uh, Omeprazole, all of these different things. Many of them are available uh, over the counter. Now, they do offer symptomatic relief. I understand if you're struggling with heartburn, if you're struggling with acid reflux, they can come in handy. But ladies and gentlemen, you've got to understand that we were never supposed to take these things long term. We were not. These provide a stopgap between when you nullify, you numb the pain of acid reflux and you change your lifestyle or your diet. But unfortunately, many people have uh, adopted the habit of just popping one of these pills every time they experience symptoms of heartburn. Well, maybe your body uh, is warning you that, hey, your body is, your stomach's not producing enough acid or enough strong acid. Or maybe it's telling you that the food that you're eating, your body is unable to break it down properly. Okay, so the body's trying to warn us, but we've gotten used to the idea of simply shutting down the signals. Symptoms are signals, okay? And if you take something that's simply going to shut off the signal, well, it doesn't mean the problem has changed. It just means that you are no longer able to feel the problem. The problem is still there and many a times it will get worse and then you will need more drugs and more procedures just to deal with it. But ignoring the symptom does not address the root cause, okay? We've got to keep that in mind. And so, of course, studies have shown that acid secretion declines with age. So this is generally something uh, that affects older people, but we're starting to see it in young people as well. We're starting to see that young people themselves struggle with digestion. And a lot of it has to do with the lifestyle. You know, we're not as physically active as we once were. We're not eating uh, the way that we once did. We're not eating home cooked meals as much. And, and of course, everything nowadays has plenty of sugar, which feeds these germs in our stomach and, and, and in our gut, which affects digestion for the worst. Now, I want to give you an illustration of digestive enzymes. Now, we mentioned, you know, the role of stomach acid uh, produced by your parietal cells, which help break down foods. But I want to talk a little bit about the role of, uh, you know, these enzymes and how they play a role in breaking down certain categories of food. So digestive enzymes are simply enzymes that break down larger molecules into smaller molecules uh, in order for them to be absorbed in our bloodstream. So uh, if you look at the illustration, here, what you're seeing is you're seeing different three of the major categories of nutrients that we consume. You've got carbs, such as found in bread. You've got proteins, such as found in meats. And you've got fats, such as found in the oils that we consume. Now, in order to break down carbs, you need certain enzymes, such as amylase, maltase, lactase, sucrase. In order to break down proteins, you need things such as pepsin, trypsin, and peptidase. And in order to break down fats, you need lipase. Now, each of these enzymes has to be present for the body to properly register and process these different types of foods. And so we have to recognize that poor enzymatic production means that you will be unable to properly break down, you know, whether it's carb, whether it's protein or whether it's fats. And that in itself will lead to health consequences, okay? And so we've got to make sure, and, and many people actually are struggling with uh, enzymatic deficiencies. You know, many people are struggling, but they're not aware because the lights never click. They've never thought to look in their gut, right? You can't break, you, you know, maybe you've eaten certain things and then you, I'll give you a good example, actually. Uh, gluten. Uh, gluten is just a protein that's found in, uh, uh, you know, uh, wheat-based products, uh, wheat, barley, rye, you know, that, you know, they contain gluten. Now, gluten itself is a protein that's very difficult to digest. And so uh, when, when we eat, uh, when uh, many people eat gluten-based products, Okay, when they eat gluten-based products, their enzymes aren't, uh, maybe they, they don't have as many enzymes or maybe their enzymes aren't strong enough. And so the enzymes are then unable to break down the gluten protein. They're unable to break down the gluten protein. And so the gluten protein is undigested and it goes through your gut and an undigested protein is not supposed to go through your gut. It's supposed to be broken down in your stomach and before it passes into your gut. But with gluten, uh, many a times it goes through your gut and it damages your gut. It kills many of the healthy and beneficial flora. This is why the body will often signal, sound the alarm and say, hey, this person ate gluten. Uh, you know, we gotta 
we gotta let them know that they shouldn't need this thing. We we just can't seem to break it down. We, you know, it's gonna make you either go to the bathroom or you know give you severe pain to teach you that hey, you gotta stop eating this. We can't break this down. Now, what are some common causes of low enzyme or low enzymatic production? Well, first you've got low stomach acid. Okay, the pH or the acidity of the chime must be in in certain uh, in a certain range for it to be effectively broken down and passed along into the uh, small intestine. Uh, again, you've got stress, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're seeing a pattern. Stress is a killer and it keeps showing itself with these different uh, complications that take place in your body. But stress also lowers acid production. You've got micronutrient deficiencies. Enzymes require coenzymes. So it may be healthier for you to supplement uh, and obtain these enzymes from an external sources. Uh, we, we also have to look at the Western diet, what's typically available to us. You know, we, we eat highly processed foods, a lot of sugars, refined sugars, and, and, and you know, overcook. You know, we barbecue everything. And, and I mean, look, they taste good. Don't let me tell you that they don't. But, you know, the, in moderation, in moderation is what I'll say. And of course, over time, with age, enzymatic production will tend to decline. And so we've got these different causes of low enzyme production, which affect the breakdown of the carbs that we eat, the proteins that we eat, and the fats that we eat, thus depriving them of the nutrients that our bodies and cells need to function properly. And so this is why, as you get older, things tend to break down and break apart. Now, of course, let's, we also have to address inflammation as a culprit, inflammation as a culprit for, uh, you know, a lot of the things that go wrong within our bodies. Now, what we mean by inflammation is really, we're talking about the immune response. Once something uh, goes through our stomach and then goes into a side of our gut and manages to sneak past those, uh, you know, the tight junction by those cells, by those gut cells and enters our bloodstream. If that thing happens to be a, vir a virus or a bacteria uh, or an undigested protein, it's going to cause trouble. It's going to lead to an immune response. We typically call that inflammation, okay? Uh, inflammation simply is the body's response to harmful items or stimuli such as pathogens, irritants, and or damaged cells. Okay, and so this inflammation will tend to make your gut leaky, okay, or chronic inflammation will tend to make your gut leaky. Now, chronic inflammation in the gut can lead to a whole host of problems. We're talking constipation, we're talking diarrhea, gas, bloating, abdominal pain, skin rashes, and even depression. Ladies and gentlemen, these are ways in which your body is trying to warn you. You know, for example, for those who may be lactose intolerant, what happens when they drink milk? Well, you know, within about 30 seconds, they have to use the bathroom. Well, what is the body doing there? The body's trying to let you know that this is not welcome in this body. We cannot break down the proteins found in this cow's milk. And therefore, you, the body has to go, force you to go to the bathroom and, and get rid of what you just consumed because the body is unable, ladies and gentlemen, unable to process what you've just consumed. So these are ways in which the body is warning and communicating to us. And of course, many of us don't listen. When we don't like what the body tells us, we simply take a pill that's going to mask the symptom or shut the body up. And that in itself is not how we were supposed to deal with this, okay? So gut inflammation is crucial. It's the body's way of warning you that, hey, what you're doing is terrible. You've got to stop it. And if you continue, it's going to to lead to things such as food sensitivity, uh, malabsorption of nutrients, brain fog, you know, autoimmune reaction. And so what are some common causes of gut inflammation? Well, we can think about gut infection, you know, parasites, opportunistic bacteria, fungi, you know, they're not fun guys, uh, autoimmune reaction, uh, inflammatory irritable bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, these typically affect your a small and large intestine, and, and, and there are patches of inflammation, which, you know, essentially damage, uh, result in damaged uh, uh, 
of gut, uh, damaged gut cells. And so those cells are no longer able to help absorb nutrients. So they're just horrible. And of course, another source of gut inflammation is the Western diet. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the Western diet, the fact that we eat a lot of gluten-based products, sugars, refined flours, processed foods, and even refined foods. Now, we also have to consider environmental toxins such as pesticides, you know, and even genetically modified organisms. You know, we're consuming these things. I think like 90% of corn in the United States is genetically modified at this point. And there's many other products that are genetically modified that we're consuming that we don't even know. But these, ladies and gentlemen, are harmful to you. Maybe not the first time you eat it, but they accumulate and the damage accumulate and it will manifest. Now, you also have intestinal dysbiosis. This is simply an imbalance of good and bad bacteria. This is why I personally encourage people to find themselves a good probiotic. Because what happens is if you're consuming the typical Western or American diet, the stereotypical, I should say, because not everybody eats you know, fast food or, or sugar-filled drinks, but if you're consuming that, you're actually feeding the harmful and, and uh, uh, you know, the harmful bacteria. You're feeding the harmful bacteria and ignoring and starving the beneficial or mutualistic gut bacteria. So the foods that you consume and of course your lifestyle will actually determine which type of bacteria will be dominant or prevalent in your gut. Of course, if you're eating well, eating clean and taking care of yourself, you're going to be feeding the healthy uh, and beneficial bacteria that help keep your metabolism up, your metabolism up, help you function properly, help keep your immune system very strong. So please keep that in mind. There's a balance of good and evil in your gut and your lifestyle as well as your diet will determine which type of germs, which type of microbes will be dominant in your gut. Now, just to recap before we move on to the next section. So far, here are some things that we covered. We covered the fact that stomach acid plays an important role in, in our gut health because it starts there before it actually gets into your small and large intestine. And so a healthy stomach has to have a low pH. And what that simply means is that uh, anything that you eat and consume that enters your stomach will be easily or rapidly broken down and the nutrients will then be able to be absorbed in your intestines. Now, any disruption in this, in, in uh, a stomach pH between 1.5 to 3.5 will, will affect our overall health. Okay, so it's sort of like an assembly line, right? If you stop one step or you disrupt one step, it backs, it creates a backlog, right? The problems continue down the line. Uh, it disrupts the flow of things. So uh, digestive enzymes play, also play an important role because a healthy stomach has to have pepsin, especially for the breakdown of proteins, but you also have to have enzymes to break down carbs. You also have to have enzymes to break down fats. And so, you know, these enzymes play also play a key role in breaking down things in the stomach and breaking down carbs, proteins, and healthy fats. And so it, they have to be broken down in order to be absorbed and provided to our cells and our organs so that they can function and not break down and get, get us sick. And so inflammation also plays a role and it's the body's response to the triggers such as pathogens, irritants, and da or damaged cells that manage to seek past, uh, sneak past our stomach acid because usually because our stomach acid is weak or it, it hasn't been doing its job or as effectively as it should. And so it, these things will ultimately make the gut barrier leaky. And so they'll sneak past and enter our blood. And when they enter our blood, that's when we'll have a manifestation of disease or chronic inflammation leads to disease. So, uh, ju and just be mindful that things such as Prilosec, Pepsid, all these different over-the-counter, uh, you know, anti um, anti-acid medications, you know, we've got to understand drugs are fine, but they are symptomatic relief. They don't go to the root cause of things. We've got to keep that in mind. But for many people, it's a first, it, it's a crutch, you know, it's, oh, well, I can eat this. I just have to take this pill. Well, maybe you got to get your body right before you eat that and you won't have to take the pill. But we, for many people, it's become almost like, well, I know my body doesn't need this, but I'm gonna do it anyways, and I'll just take the pill to deal with the consequences. Ladies and gentlemen, that does not fix the root cause of your disease. It simply cuts off the signaling mechanism so you don't feel the pain, you don't feel the disruption, you don't feel the trouble that is being caused. Please, please understand that concept. 
Now, let's talk about what happens. I, oh, oh, excuse me. Okay. Let's take a look at the modern diet. You know, we mentioned, you know, the Western diet, the modern diet. Uh, you know, and we, you know, we mentioned some of the things that they consist of, such as grains, industrial seed oils, refined sugar, processed food, carb, carbonated beverages, and genetically modified organisms. Now, I want to make this clear. This is not what everybody in America or the West eats. I understand that. This is sort of like a stereotypical approach, but it is so prevalent. It is absolutely so prevalent that most people consume these things at any given point during their day. And so we've got to understand that, you know, yes, they're convenient and many a times they're cheap and they're very accessible, but there are consequences to overindulging on these things. Now, these things typically inflame the gut, okay, especially when not consumed in moderation. Sugar, perhaps sugar and genetically modified organisms more so than anything else, okay? And so, we look at, we live in interesting times. You know, we, we've made great strides and progress in, in terms of healthcare, in terms of medicine. You know, we have antibiotics now, which can, can help us when we're, when we're sick and, and, you know, we don't know what else to do. We've got cesarean birth for, you know, women who just aren't able to push. You know, we've got, we made so many progresses in our times, you know, in this day and age in, in terms of medicine, but, these facilitating factors have also led to, well, maybe not directly led to, but they've also contributed to a very sedentary lifestyle, okay? And what that means is this, because we have all these conveniences, because we have a car, we don't walk as much anymore. Even the walking is a way to keep the body healthy, okay? So yes, innovation and technology and, and you know, they're wonderful things and they offer many benefits, but for many of us, we've taken these to be, well, I don't, I don't have to go running because anytime I have to go out, I'll just drive to where I need to drive. And so, you know, uh, pros and cons, I, I guess, you know, and so many of the fiber rich foods that we once ate, you know, before a lot of these innovations in agriculture and food production, you know, have been replaced by processed and fiber free options. And so, yes, these foods are quicker and many a times they're cheaper, but remember they're lacking what foods once did, what foods once offered. And so, you know, the Western diet has a significant impact on our health because this illustration that you see here, if you're guilty of eating or having a diet that is uh, uh, heavily consistent of these things or of any of these things, especially the refined sugar and genetically modified organism, you know, then here's what's going to happen to your gut health. Remember, we said there's over 100 billion uh, uh, germ micro, 100 trillion microbes in your gut, uh, making, uh, consisting of about a thousand different species. Well, one of the first things that happens if you're someone guilty of consuming these foods is, well, your variety, your microbial species, the important ones, they're going to start dying out. Because remember, what you're eating is feeding either the good germs or the bad germs. And so these things, especially the sugars, are going to feed the bad germs, the germs that are harmful, not the germs that are beneficial and it will help your metabolism and your immune system. And so one of the detrimental effects of this Western diet is that we are losing uh, key uh, microbial species. Another impact is that now, yes, we're not dying of, you know, uh, you know, diseases like polio. Uh, we're not we're not plagued by these diseases like we were once. However, what happens is we are now facing an avalanche of chronic diseases like never before. Somebody said this, if you watch a movie in the 1950s, you know, you could count maybe like uh, in one hand, uh, the number of obese people in the movie, right? And, and they were trying to uh, withhold obese people. It was just not very common. Today, you know, a significant amount of adults are, are obese, right? Uh, I mean, you look at, for example, uh, just diabetes, for example, 11% of the American population is diabetic, okay? But interestingly enough, one in three, uh, about 88 million adults uh, are pre-diabetic, which means that within the next two to five years, they will become diabetic if they continue living their lives uh, in the way that they are living. So you're looking at an avalanche of diabetics in the next couple of years.
And the same thing with other diseases, you know, we mentioned obesity, diabetes, you know, the same thing with high blood pressure, with all the adults, with all, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, adults that are facing or struggling with high blood pressure, it affects, you know, so many people, millions of people. And so we're witnessing a significant increase in chronic diseases. Yes, people aren't dying from them, but we all have gotten comfortable with the idea that, hey, let's pill consisting of grains, industrial seed oils, refined sugar processed foods, uh, carbonated beverages, and even genetically modified foods, these are harmful. They disrupt our gut. Uh, building blocks that are essential for health, essential for everything that we consume. Now, think about it like this. Amino acids are letters. Now, when you put these letters together, you're able to form sentences, and that's what a protein is, okay? A protein is simply uh, 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 an amalgamation or putting together or a sequence of amino acids. And so you can think about a sentence is a bunch of letters coming together, okay? Now, the protein, when it enters our stomach, remember, a healthy stomach has a strong, P, uh, low pH, or it's a strong acid. It's able to break down anything. When the protein enters our stomach, the stomach acid should be strong enough, but it should also have enzymes such as pepsin to further break down proteins. And so it's going to break it down into its uh, singular uh, uh, amino acid units. That am those amino acids will then go single file into our small intestine to be absorbed into our bloodstream to be delivered to our cells. But the problem with gluten proteins, notably glutenin and gliad gliadin, is that they are highly elastic, uh, which means they're highly resistant to protease enzymes, which are responsible to breaking down proteins in your digestive tract. And so what happens is, when people consume gluten, those who are gluten intolerant, they're unable to break down these proteins. And so these proteins go into your gut undigested. Well, they're not supposed to go in your gut undigested. They're supposed to go in your gut as individual amino acids. And so that same protein, now that it's going through your gut, is going to disrupt a lot of the beneficial bacteria, beneficial microbes that are there, it's going to disrupt them. And it's eventually going to force its way into your blood. And so the body has to wake you up. It has to sound an alarm to let you know that this is not allowed. Do not do this. And so you may feel pain. You may feel uh, urge to, to throw up or diarrhea. You may feel any type of symptom that your body is trying to lose to let you know that don't eat this again. Yeah. And so this can trigger an autoimmune reaction or an autoimmune response manifesting as celiac disease, wheat allergy, irritable bowel syndrome, or inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. And so the consumption of these proteins or gluten protein for someone who lacks, you know, the protease enzymes or someone who lacks the enzyme or gluten intolerant, the consumption of gluten-based products, okay, wheat, barley, rye, notes, will actually damage their gut tissue over time. Which, because you're damaging the gut tissue, you're also disrupting the balance between good and bad bacteria, increasing the presence of bad bacteria while killing off the good bacteria, which means your immune system is weakened, which means your metabolism is slowed. It's a cascading effect. Okay, almost like a domino, you tip one over, it falls and knocks one down, it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going.
Now, let's look at industrial seed oils. Now, this is crucial because, you know, many a times when you go to your store, your local store, and, you, you know, you go to the oil section, you're going to see a lot of uh, options. You're going to see a lot of choices. Now, look, some are healthier than others. I just want to say that. Some are healthier than others. Now, vegetable oil, industrial seed oil, a lot of them are extracted from vegetables. They're extracted from plants using either a chemical solvent or an oil mill. Then they're generally purified and refined and chemically altered. Okay. Now, there are some that will say that they are expeller pressed, which means they're extracted manually. So think about, you know, grabbing, you know, let's say, for example, an olive and pressing it down until you squeeze the oil out of it. So the structure, the molecular structure of the oil has been kept intact, as opposed to, let's say, putting that same olive on, uh, you know, in, in fire and, and boiling it off and, and, you know, being able to extract the oil like that. Well, yeah, it's still olive oil, but the way in which it was obtained disrupted the molecular structure. And so when you consume that, you're not getting a healthy oil or an oil with that's going to be very beneficial to you. You're getting an oil that's going to be rancid and damaged. And of course, it's not going to be of much benefit to your cells. It, and it may actually be harmful. Now, a lot of these, I want you to take a look at the illustration here. Uh, and just, to, I mean, not to get too deep into the rabbit hole, but these are a list of fats that are generally healthier. And these are a list of fats that are generally uh, just horrible. Um, you know, margarine, ladies and gentlemen, is, is horrible, please. Uh, canola oil. By the way, if you ever take a look at maybe like your bug spray or your insect killer, uh, many of them will have canola oil as the active ingredient. That's right, folks, you're eating something that kills bugs dead. And so uh, there's a reason why I have these oils listed here. And on the left, you have oils that are that are generally uh, healthier. It, it, a lot of it depends on how they are obtained, how they are processed, and uh, whether how well they're able to retain their molecular structure after processing, after purification, uh, uh, you know. And so uh, one of the ways in which these oils cause inflammation, remember inflammation is the body's mechanism of dealing with any harmful substance entering your gut or your blood. One of the ways in which is because a lot of these oils, you have these omegas, have, have to have, uh, you have these omegas. Okay, think of it like omega-6 to omega-3 ratio must be one-to-one. -one. However, in the Western diet, that balance, that one-to-one -one balance has been disrupted. And so for many people, well, typically um, in, in the Western diet, we find that the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is about 20 to 1. That's horrible, ladies and gentlemen, that, because not only do we take oils that are uh, you know, that are processed in a way that damages their molecular structure, but many a times we even heat them up, we fry with them. You know, we make it even worse. We make it even more rancid. And so that disrupts this relationship. And so, and we consume these things uh, to, to harmful uh, results in our bodies and, and especially in our heart, heart health. And so a lot of these oils will actually cause oxidation. And so, for example, if you take a look, uh, and this is uh, the best way that I can illustrate this point. Uh, if you take a look at this, uh, let's pretend that this was oil. Okay, now what, what you see here is, is space between the top of the oil and the top of the bottom, okay? There's oxygen there. When oil sits on the shelf like this, with this level of oxygen up there, okay? Uh, it's going to cause oxidation. It's going to make the oil rancid, especially the longer it stays there like that, the worse it's going to be. Uh, that's because you have polyunsaturated fats. They react with oxygen and they begin to deteriorate. Okay, now let me tell you why this is crucial because these polyunsaturated fats are supposed to make up your cell membranes. Now imagine that they're deteriorating the longer they're sitting on the shelf because there's oxygen uh, trapped in the air, trapped in there, it's deteriorating. But here you are consuming this thing and it's going to be used to make up your cell membrane. And so the integrity of your cells is already weakened. And so this is why many people fall sick easily. Okay, now you also have another category called trans fats. Uh, you're looking at things like margarine and it's, it's uh, obtained through a process called hydrogenation. Uh, it, it's a process of hardening vegetable oils, uh, you know, to, to make it like almost like butter. So think margarine, for example. And so long story short, trans fats 
uh, will actually lead to chronic inflammation and chronic disease, overconsumption of it or consumption of trans fats. So long story short, to make things easier for you not to get too scientific into these things, um, the list of oils on the right are harmful. Uh, please try to avoid them for the sake of your health and your families. The list of oils on the left are very beneficial, much more so than these. Now, of course, depending on how you store it and how, how you cook it will we'll also determine to what extent it's going to be uh, a harmful or beneficial to you. But generally, I would strongly recommend that you stick to the list of oil uh, on the left hand side of the screen. Now, Refined sugars. Now, we couldn't just ignore sugar. Sugar is the uh, uh, <laughs> main culprit of all of this thing. Now, sugar is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Added sugar is everywhere. And so it's not that sugar itself is bad. It's that we are consuming, ladies and gentlemen, an excessive amount of sugar. And this plays a role in virtually every aspect of your health. In 1822, the average American consumed nine grams of sugar uh, each and every day. Nine grams. Today, we consume 77 grams of sugar each and every day. Just to give you an example, one can of Coca-Cola contains about 44 grams of sugar. Now, of course, you have diet versions, but the point is one can of Coke will give you 44 grams of sugar, okay? And you have people who drink multiple cans of soda a day. According to the American Heart Association, they recommend that men get a maximum of about 38 grams of sugar a day. Well, one can of soda uh, exceeds that amount. Uh, women are recommended to get no more than 25 grams of sugar and children are recommended to get uh, between 12 and 25 grams of sugar a day, okay? That's what your body can handle. But the reason sugar is everywhere and even in healthy foods, I mean, I, I've seen these salads, you know, will often contain sugar, uh, you know, uh, healthy juices will often contain sugar, excuse me. Uh, you know, the dressing for salads will, will be jam packed full of sugar. Now, let me give you an ex a reason why sugar is everywhere. Sugar is everywhere because it's such a versatile product. Uh, you know, it, even canned foods that have nothing to do with sugar will often have sugar in there because sugar also plays a role as a preservative. As a matter of fact, sugar is such a versatile product that it can be used as a balkan agent to give a certain texture. It can be used as a preservative to give a uh, food product longer shelf life. Uh, it can be used as obviously uh, as a flavor enhancer. Uh, it can be used to give a food product its color. Think about creme brulee. It can be used to give a certain viscosity. Think about uh, you know the thickness of something and it can be used as an anticoagulant. Think about you know like a semi-solid state like jello. Sugar is such a versatile product that it's in products that aren't supposed to have sugar, okay? The food manufacturer is that it there. And so you're eating something thinking to yourself, well, this is healthy, but no, the food manufacturers put sugar in it, not for the taste necessarily, but for any of these other uh, properties. But that accumulation of sugar, ladies and gentlemen, can affect your brain. It can affect your eye health. It can affect your heart. It can affect uh, your stomach, your obesity. <laughs> Excuse me, it can affect, uh, it can cause uh, type uh, 2 diabetes, it can cause toothache, it can affect uh, your joint health, it can affect your brain health. Sugar, by the way, is one of the most addicting substances on earth, okay? It is one of the most addicting substances on earth, and many of us are addicted to sugar. And that's a fact, many of us are addicted to sugar. And of course, when we think about processed foods, I want you to take a look at this. It all looks delicious. I, I don't know if there are any uh, vegetarians or vegans, and, you know, in the audience, but I want you to take a look at this, uh, uh, you know, spread. You know, uh, a nice family gathering. You know, the family gathers, and this is what uh, you would typically find at a barbecue or a picnic or something like that. It looks good, tempting, but. We, we have to understand something, okay? Meat in itself it is an important component of human health. It is. Uh, don't let me get, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, denouncing, you know, meat. But we also have to look at what's being done to a lot of the meats that we consume. Processed, processed meats uh, can be unhealthy. You know, this is generally meat that's been preserved by curing or salting or, or smoking or drying off canning. But what actually happens is in order to preserve a lot of these meats, 
uh, you know, maybe at your local deli, you'll see this, you know, they have to use nitrates. Nitrates will actually preserve the color, it can improve the flavor and actually prevent uh, bacterial growth, which allows for the food to be preserved longer. And of course, if you're in a business of selling things, you want things to last a lot longer. You don't want them to rot. And so when you consume these nitrates, when you when you take these meats that have been uh, uh, preserved using nitrate-based products, well, when you expose them to heat, when you go to grill or fry or barbecue, you know, these products, the heat will actually turn them into cancer-causing nitrosamines. Okay, so those nitrates, when exposed to heat, will become nitrosamines. And so, you know, you also have a, a, a category called poly, a PAC, a PAH, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Okay, now this, these compounds are formed when organic matter, in this case meat, are exposed to a high level of heat. So the process of grilling, frying, or smoking heat okay, uh, excuse me, the process of grilling, frying, or smoking meat will result in the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Now, here's what's interesting to, to understand. The same polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, when exposed to heat, will actually, well, studies show that they, they, they can cause cancer, okay? So you've got the preservative the nitrates that are used as a preservative on these meats, when exposed to heat, become nitrosamines, which can lead to cancer, okay? Then you've got the burning of organic matter results in these compounds, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and studies show they can also lead to cancer. Now you also have uh, another category of compounds that can lead to cancer as well, heterocyclic amines, okay? This is when meat is cooked at high temperatures. Okay, so what am I saying, ladies and gentlemen? Eat more greens. <laughs> Consider a plant-based diet. But if you're going to eat meat, just be mindful. Uh, be mindful not to over-grill or over-fry. As a matter of fact, you know, when you think of, you know, putting meat on a grill and you see those black marks, those charred marks, you know, those are heterocyclic amines. Okay, those, those the, the burn marks on the meat, I know it looks tempting, you know, you know, and it's synonymous with barbecue or grill, but they're not the best things for you. They're cancer causing. And so maybe you might want to just flake them off or flake that piece off. But the overcooking, the overgrilling, the over frying, okay, can, you know, is what exposes us to cancer causing organisms or compounds. Now, when we talk about carbonated beverages, you know, we're talking about things that contain carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide in bubbles neutralizes stomach acid. Essentially, they make the stomach acid weaker. Now, of course, if you think back to what we talked about when we talked about stomach acid, we talked about how the importance of the body uh, having a strong acid in order to be able to break things down so that they can properly go into our gut health. Now, stomach acid should be strong, but a lot of these carbonated beverages, they weaken or they neutralize the stomach acid. So food actually sits in your stomach longer. Food sits in your stomach longer. And so when food stays in your stomach longer, guess what? The bacteria that are in your stomach will have a field day. They'll begin to eat the food and eat and, uh, you know, duplicate and reproduce and grow and expand. And, and, and as they're eating, the, especially if you have carbs in your stomach, as they're eating it, they're going to ferment. Okay, the, the gas that they're going to release, which will cause acid reflux or belching uh, or bloating or, you know, uh, you know, gas can lead to uh, irritable bowel syndrome flare ups. So uh, another another reason to just be mindful of and, and try to just drink more water is that cola beverages have phosphorus and phosphorus has been linked uh, to an increase in loss of calcium via the kidney so you know again not only with the high amount of sugar 44 grams of sugar but you also have the phosphorus which can lead to a loss of your calcium which affects the health of your bones overall and so the solution, ladies and gentlemen, try to avoid carbonated beverages, but certainly uh, avoid carbonated beverages before or during a meal. Okay, if you want to drink it, fine, but uh, don't drink it anytime before or anytime after a meal. Drink it, you know, uh, when it's 
when it's far out, when your body is currently not digesting or planning on digesting uh, anything uh, anytime soon. Now, of course, uh, increase uh, salt, well, ideally sea salt. I know everybody's afraid of salt now, but try sea salt. It's actually healthier. Uh, many times they have more minerals than table salt and typical table salt. You know, add that to your water or add that to your food and, and just kind of replenish some of the things that your body needs in order to function properly. And of course, let's talk about, uh, last but not least, let's talk about genetically modified foods. Now, uh, uh, <laughs> this is ubiquitous too, eh, as it's, it's now everywhere. But I wanted to, to tell you that these uh, genetically modified organisms, um, you know, they, they actually damage and inflame the gut. Uh, now, you can think about something like uh, toxic herbicides, uh, like Roundup. You know, maybe some of you use Roundup to kill weeds around. They're generally applied to genetically modified, you know, that have been applied to, to crops and GMO crops. Uh, they're detrimental to your health because a lot of times what is sprayed on these plants, okay, gets absorbed by these plants. So think about it like this. When you see that plane flying over a huge field of, of crops and it's spraying uh, these crops, it's killing the, the, the bugs. And yes, that's, that's, you know, how you preserve or you save yield. And, and that's fine, but when those bugs die, having been poisoned, they go back into that soil and they take that poison with them into the soil from whence the crops draw their nutrients along with the poison that went into the crops. So think about that. And so the consumption of genetically modified organism has been linked to four types of cancer, has been linked to strokes and many other diseases. Uh, one study, the Seralini study, uh, was uh, looked at the effects on, of uh, genetically modified organisms on rats that were fed with genetic GMO uh, pellets, GMO rat foods, compared to non-GMO or regular rat food. And what they found in those rats were uh, GMO, the rat, rats that were fed genetically modified foods uh, had liver, kidney, and heart damage uh, compared to uh, the rats that were fed regular rat pellets or rat food. Uh, so ge the, gen the genetically modified crops damaged the intestinal linings of those rats. And I think you can see from the image that uh, this is an illustration of the normal intestine of rats that were fed uh, regular food corn. And then we look at the intestine of rats that were fed genetically modified corns. And, and you see here erosions, you see fissures, and you see damaged cells. You know, they look like they've been bombed, okay? But ladies and gentlemen, the foods that you eat plays a role in your gut health, which plays a role in your immune system, which plays a role in your mental health, which plays a role in every part of you. It plays a role in your ability to lose weight and metabolism, your energy, your focus. It starts with the gut and it takes us back to Hippocrates. All disease begins in the gut. And so unfortunately today, 80% of packaged foods in the US contain some sort of genetically modified organism. We're talking about 93% of soy is genetically modified in the US, 93% of cotton is genetically modified, 90% of canola, canola oil, everybody, 90% of canola is genetically modified and 86% of corn, corn oil, everybody, 86% of corn is genetically modified. So how do you fix the gut? Uh, I mean, this is just, uh, you know, I, I hope you're not thinking of me as the prophet of gloom and doom, but, you know, I'm just illustrating what has been plaguing us as a nation, as a people, uh, and even worldwide. How do we fix the gut? Well, the first thing you have to do, you've got to, uh, you know, change your mind from simply treating the symptomatic uh, 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 issues of disease to focusing on the root cause. If, if you spend your time mowing over the weeds, they'll just grow back the next day. Sometimes you've got to dig down and uproot them from the ground in order that they don't grow anymore. So there's a difference between simply cutting the top of the weed and digging down and uprooting the weed. We've got to look at the root causes. So the first thing you want to do is number one, get tested for H. pylori, you know, a simple test you can get uh, from your doctor to see if you have uh, 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 an overgrowth of these uh, germs uh, in your stomach. Because remember, not only are they responsible for the, for, for the development of ulcers, but they can actually stop or affect your acid production. So you wanna make sure you don't have an overgrowth of these things. Number two, manage your stresses, manage chronic stress. Find your peace, self-care is crucial. 
make sure you remove certain people, certain circumstances, certain things from your life that are constantly bringing you trouble. Okay, so you want to manage chronic stress. You want to avoid acid suppressing drugs. Okay, you've got to understand, take them for symptomatic purposes, but then you've got to do something different. You've got to look into what you're eating. You've got to look into whether maybe, you know, you're missing certain enzymes. Maybe your stomach acid isn't strong enough. Maybe you've got an overgrowth of H. pylori, but you don't want to take these things for long periods of time. Actually, uh, stomach acid suppressing drugs were never meant to be taken beyond several weeks. They were never meant to be taken beyond several weeks. Yet you have people who pop these things day in and day out. Okay. If you're looking for supplements, try something, uh, a supplement that contains hydrochloric acid and even pepsin, because these enzymes are crucial for your ability to break down foods and you need them to properly break down foods so that they can go into your stomach, so they can go into your gut or your small intestine and then get absorbed by your small intestine and then ultimately uh, into your bloodstream. I wanna give you an illustration with the image on top. What you're looking at is a, is a piece of chicken, okay? There's that piece of chicken in a vial of acid. As you can see, it doesn't fully break down. When that piece of chicken is placed in a vial of pepsin, which breaks down protein, it doesn't fully break down. It only breaks down partially. However, when you combine hydrochloric acid and pepsin, guess what happens to the piece of chicken? It's completely dissolved. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what you want. That's why any digestive issues, the first thing you want to do, consider supplementing with pepsin and hydrochloric acid. Maybe your body is not producing enough. Maybe you've got H. pylori shutting it down. Maybe you've got stress that's affecting your ability to produce these things. Okay, you've got to start by addressing your deficiencies in pepsin and hydrochloric acid. And there are supplements that, come, that contain these two and you want to re-strengthen your stomach acid because food has to be properly broken down before it goes into your gut. And bitters, consider bitters. These are herbs that can also stimulate acid production and improve digestion. Uh, one, one that I'm familiar with is called Swedish bitters. I use it, I love it. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I'm not promoting a product, but I'm, I'm saying it's something that I know many people use and, and, and uh, can vouch for it. You also want to consider replacing digestive enzymes. So one of the ways you're going to do that is you're going to test for the pH of your stomach to determine if it's acidic enough. The goal for stomach acid is to have a pH between 1.5 and 3.5. Uh, the lower it is, the stronger it is. Anything above 3.5 means your stomach acid is weak. Okay, it doesn't properly break down things. So consider taking uh, hydrochloric acid with pepsin, which will allow for faster breakdown of proteins, carbon and fats in the stomach. Uh, consider improving your digestion with bitter herbs. Okay, they can trigger the production of digestive enzymes. Uh, you know, you can also consider apple cider vinegar, lemon juice, a sauerkraut. You know, these are things that are full of probiotics as well. Ginger, artichoke, these things are also uh, can help uh, with replacing uh, your digestive enzymes. And of course, for the gut, uh, you want to consider antioxidants because the solution to inflammation is really antioxidants, right? If you have a fire, the solution is water, right? And so when you have constant inflammation along your gut or in your blood, please consider antioxidants. So these are molecules that fight uh, free radicals or free radical damage in the body, and they try to neutralize them, uh, these unstable molecules that cause chaos in your body. And so they're usually found in, in, in foods such as plant-based foods, especially in fruits, vegetables, uh, plant-based and whole foods. So, you know, you want to increase your intake of these foods and, and maybe give the Western or stereotypical Western diet a break. Um, you know, free radicals, uh, these are molecules that harm uh, the body, if left unchecked, can lead to oxidative stress. Um, you know, so you want to consider dietary intake of antioxidants uh, as important, as crucial for your optimal health. And uh, these can be found in foods, including flavonoids, vitamin C and E. Okay, so uh, that's how you fix the gut. And of course, I, maybe I didn't emphasize it in this slide, but probiotics get a good probiotics. I, I can, when we're done here, I can tell you which probiotics I take personally. I, I love it. And so um, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, that's the lesson. That's gut health. These are some of the most important things that you should know about your gut. 
Um, it's been my privilege, it's been my honor to present you that particular seminar today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Paula Blackburn for facilitating this, as well as the Gates Public Library. Uh, I, I want to end by reading you a quote. Uh, this is from Thomas Edison, and I love this quote because it says, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his or her patients in the care of the human frame, uh, in a proper diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. For this hour and a half, that uh, for this time that I've had you, I'd like to think that I've interested you in the care of the human frame. I'd like to think that I've interested you in getting a better diet, okay? And I'd like to think that we've addressed the cause uh, of a lot of these uh, gut-based diseases and ways in which we can prevent these diseases. So I'd like to think that I've been the doctor of the future as so eloquently worded by Thomas Edison. I wanna thank you for joining us. This has been a presentation on gut health. These are some of the other topics that I speak on. I look forward to having uh, uh, the Gates Public Library invite me once more to come and talk to uh, its patrons uh, about this topic. So uh, it's been my pleasure to present to you. Thank you. and. Uh, um, uh, you know, if I may, uh, this is uh, how you can get in contact with me. Um, and these are some of the recommendations that uh, I uh, mentioned throughout the presentation. If anybody has a question, uh, we will take them now. I'm Dr. Cedric. Thank you again.